Uh, good morning. My name is Carlos Sassel and I'm the publisher of the World Bank. And I will make an assumption that this technology is working uh, and begin. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Igor Lesko, who I met this past November at the Berlin 10 Open Access Conference in Stellenbosch, as well as the organizers of today's event for the opportunity to be with you uh, virtually. Um, for those of you who may not know, the World Bank is the leading development institution in the world, <clears throat> and our mission is to eradicate extreme poverty and to promote shared prosperity. In 2010, the bank embarked on what we call an open agenda, which consists really uh, of three, three major components. Uh, the first of which is access to information, the second one, open data, and the third, and that part for which I am responsible, is open access. Uh, and at the bank, we call all of this the open agenda. And the open agenda is really transforming the World Bank, uh, but more importantly, the open movement is transforming the way we do development. And when I say development, I'm referring to economic and social development, particularly in the countries in the developing world, um, uh, which is the main focus of the bank's work. Next slide is here. Aha, the slide did not come up. What do I do? Okay, so we seem to have gotten, I'll move here. Okay, sorry. We had a little technical difficulty, but uh, I think we're, we're through with it. But, uh, but basically the traditional approach to development was the transfer of resources from rich countries in the north to poorer countries in the south. And these were typically accompanied by reform or policy prescriptions uh, telling our, our partners uh, what needed to be done. And the development institutions that channeled the transfers were opaque. Basically, we mean there was very little transparency of the projects that were financed, and most importantly, the results that were achieved. Um, and the engagement with the developing countries was with a narrow set of government elites. So we were really not engaging with uh, the citizens of the countries, uh, which were the focus of our work. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, with the open agenda, with open data, open access, open aid, open government, uh, and broadly speaking what we call the open agenda, is transforming the way development is done. And I would also say that it's also transforming uh, the, the way we publish. So if we go back uh, as recently as three years, uh, at the bank, we had a commercial publishing uh, model. Uh, and uh, we worked through a network of print and online distributors around the world. We offered steep discounts to our customers in developing countries uh, because of our mission uh, as the World Bank. Um, and the result of that was that Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia became our second and third largest markets measured in number of copies of our books that we sold. And you know, I, I've been in publishing for uh, the better part of 30 years, and I think I can honestly say there isn't another publisher in the world who could make that claim, uh, a publisher based in North America or Europe, who would claim that Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia were their third, second and third uh, largest markets. Um, we were very good, and well, we still are, but we were very good at what we do and in reaching our readers, uh, both in the countries of the North and the countries of the South. And uh, what's very important is that we had a sustainable business model with about 50% uh, of sales from the, 50% uh, of our revenues from the sales of our online databases and our e-library and the balance from the sale of our printed books. So our publishing model wasn't broken. Uh, in fact, it worked, worked rather well, but it became evident that we weren't the best that we could be. Uh, so and let me explain why, and that's it really it derives from the bank's mission statement. Now, I'm an incredibly privileged individual uh, to work for an organization whose mission statement starts out by declaring that our dream is a world free of poverty. And now the, the bank, our focus now, as I think I mentioned earlier, is the eradication of extreme poverty around the world and promoting what we call shared prosperity 
which basically means that when there is economic growth, we will be measuring the, the impact of that growth on the 40% of the population that is less well off. And the objective would be that a larger share of the benefits of economic growth go to that 40% extent, and, and rather than to the people that are, um, are better off. But the other point is that in our mission statement, uh, there was a call to open access. The statement there that says to help, our peop to help people help themselves in their environment, uh, we do that in part by sharing knowledge. So there was nothing in the World Bank mission statement that said that uh, we do that through commercial publishing. Um, really, it was about sharing uh, our knowledge, and that was an important distinction. So let me go here. So the World Bank's open agenda, it's about being open about what we know by making our data and our knowledge open. It's about being open about what we do by being transparent with respect to um, our operations and results. It's about being open uh, regarding how we work by working in partnerships uh, and promoting uh, partnerships for openness by advocating for open access, for example. Uh, and it's about promoting open government by ensuring that the countries that we work with, uh, that we set the example with respect to transparency and accountability um, as a way to uh, help them achieve those same goals. So why is this important? Um, uh, it's important because I have a view and my colleagues here have the view that the more open you are, the more accountable you are. And the more accountable you are, the more likely you are to achieve the results that you're after. In our particular case, refers to um, um, development results. So the World Bank's Open Agenda uh, has uh, four pillars, and the first pillar of which was the access to information policy, um, which was uh, implemented in July of 2010. Our access to information policy is modeled after that of the US uh, and India, Freedom of Information Acts. Uh, the basic change was that in the old policy, which was called the disclosure policy, the emphasis was that everything is confidential except for a small list of documents that we will make open. The access to information policy put, turned that around and basically said everything is open, we're fully transparent, but there is a small list of things that, that do remain confidential. And those include things like HR records uh, and, and things that one would expect to be kept uh, confidential. Since uh, the launch of the Access to Information Policy in July of 2010, uh, millions of pages have been viewed. Now there's a quote there from Chad Dobson, uh, who uh, is a head of the Bank Information Center. It's a nonprofit uh, NGO, which is oftentimes critical of the bank, uh, but he called the bank's access to information policy the gold standard for financial institutions. So if access to information was the first pillar of the bank's open agenda, uh, open data is the second. Uh, and open data, in fact, happened just slightly earlier than the access to information. In April of 2010, the bank opened up its statistical databases, other data sets, and a lot of the analytical tools that we use uh, in, in our own economic analysis. Uh, and a lot of these data sets, in particular something called World Development Indicators, uh, was, it was available, but it was available behind the subscription wall. Um, and there were restrictions on the reuse of the data. And with the open data policy, we opened up the data to the world um, and we lifted restrictions on the use and reuse of that data. Um, and we did a number of other uh, activities around open data. And it really has been, from our perspective, a, a, a very good outcome. And we're also looking at ways to use that data in ways that are uh, innovative and, and, that, and that demonstrate results. So for example, one is a program uh, that the bank has launched, uh, the Mapping for Results Portal. And uh, what this portal does, um, it basically it maps the world and but in the green dots that you see on the map uh, represent World Bank projects, the projects that the World Bank has financed. And you can click on them 
uh, to get uh, ever more detailed information regarding the project, uh, its objectives, what it cost, uh, whether it's been completed, and whether the outcomes that were anticipated have been achieved or not. So this basically deals with the uh, access to information and the open data. I could say a lot more, but uh, in the interest of time, I move on to the access to information. So uh, in a, a seminal speech that Bob Zellick gave at Georgetown University in 2010, he talked about uh, the need to do development differently. And among the things he said was that the aim was to open up the treasure chest of the World Bank's uh, data and knowledge uh, to everyone uh, in the world. So as publisher, uh, I'm responsible for uh, part of that uh, treasure chest of knowledge. Um, and uh, this was supposed to be a moving slide, but in any case, uh, as, as the publishing program, uh, we publish across a tremendous field uh, of, uh, of subjects. So I like to say that we deal with everything from early childhood development to old age security, from fragile and conflict states to health, from climate change to the investment climate, and from gender equality to jobs. And this is what we call uh, the treasure chest of World Bank knowledge. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the changes that we had seen coming anyway before the launch of the open access policy. And this slide that I'm showing here shows the dissemination of our print books over the years going back to our fiscal year 2008 uh, through our fiscal year 2012, which it's an interesting date because um, we launched the access to information uh, in July of 2012 which was the start of our fiscal year 2013. So what you're seeing here predates open access. So even before we adopted open access formally as a publisher, we were noticing there was a steep decline in the total dissemination of our print publications. And there were reasons for that uh, which are detailed, and I won't go into the details. But at the same time, uh, there was, uh, we were launching our social media sites on Facebook and Twitter, uh, and uh, we were uh, seeing a tremendous growth in the followers and the interactions we were having with our readers through social media channels. So although we were distributing fewer books in print, we had a much more active engagement with our readers, in particular through social media, although that wasn't the only venue. Um, and then here, what this slide shows, and if you recall the previous ones, the scale on the vertical axis was thousands. The scale on this axis is millions. Uh, and what you see is that there's huge growth in the uh, dissemination of our books digitally through channels that were free before we were formally open access. Because our books were available on Google Books uh, to be read. They were available on ESU, on Scribd, and through the bank's website. And uh, basically, in the year ended June 30th last year, our fiscal year 2012, the total dissemination of our books in print was just over 100,000 copies, uh, or excuse me, yeah, I think just over 100,000 copies, uh, while the dissemination of our books digitally, and these I define as online reads through services like Google Books um, or downloads from the bank's website. Uh, and that reached 6.2 million. So that's an incredible ratio of 6.2 million to 100 and some thousand copies in print. So clearly something was going on, and, and, and of course we were aware of that and uh, leveraging that as much as we could. So if Access to information and open data were the first and second pillars of the bank's open agenda. Open access and creative commons are the third and fourth. Uh, and uh, again, the, uh, uh, it's, we're open with respect to our data and knowledge. And uh, we're also open with respect to our operations and results. And that, some of that falls under publishing, 
for example, because I'm responsible for the World Bank Annual Report, which is about our results. So uh, in uh, 2011, I commissioned a study, a strategic review of World Bank publications, um, the objective of which uh, was to create uh, a policy, uh, to create a cutting edge publishing program that fully embraces free and open access. And the recommendations that came out of that review were that we adopt an open access policy, that we implement Creative Commons licensing, and in our particular case, uh, we're a publisher in our own right, and everything that we publish is available under the Creative Commons CC BY license, the attribution license, which is the most liberal license uh, of the CC licenses. Uh, but our researchers also publish externally. For example, journals, uh, they publish articles in journals. Uh, and uh, our open access policy covers that also. However, uh, we, in, with respect to journal articles, for example, the requirement is the deposit of the author accepted manuscript in our repository. And the licensing is a more restrictive one that does not allow commercial reuse uh, and does not allow derivative products. So uh, we took those recommendations to heart. And in July of 2010, excuse me, July of 2012, we implemented an, access to uh, an open access policy and Creative Commons licensing. And just before that, in April of 2012, uh, we launched our uh, open access repository, which we call the Open Knowledge Repository. Uh, now, when at launch a year ago, or just under a year ago, uh, we had 3,000 documents. That has grown to 10,000 documents today. And it will be 12,000 documents by June 30th of this year. Uh, we've had our, uh, we expect our millionth document download around the anniversary in April. Uh, this past month of February, uh, we had 170,000 document downloads. And that has the, the number of downloads per month has been growing rapidly. Uh, and what's very, in, very important to us is that 48% of those downloads are from the developing countries. So uh, this raises the question, as we went from a commercial publishing model where uh, basically we could measure our impact through dissemination, but also through our revenues, through, through what we were earning through the sale of our content, uh, if that was a measure of success, the question becomes, what is the currency of open access publishing? And uh, from our view, uh, that is development impact. So we, our mission is to, uh, our dream is a world free of poverty, as our mission statement says. And to the extent that uh, what we do uh, can further that aim, uh, then that's the impact that we're looking for. So to demonstrate that, uh, the slide I put up is a cover of the last annual report, uh, which was uh, released in October of last year. And we did an infographic for the cover, which highlights some of the results that have been achieved by our client countries, by the countries with which we work. And these are really their results. Uh, but in one way or another, the bank has contributed uh, uh, to achieving some of these re results. Now, I don't for a second propose that anything that we do in publishing is directly or indirectly responsible for these results. Um, but to the extent that World Bank knowledge, and which is one of our, our key assets, is helping to drive these results, then that's what we're looking to achieve. That's how we measure impact. And that's the currency of open access publishing. And with that, I will end. And I'm happy to entertain questions. If you have uh, questions for Carlos, feel free to type them into the chat window or uh, press the talk button if you would like to speak. Hi, Carlos. This is Mary Lou from the Open Courseware Consortium. I'm wondering if you, you can tell us uh, what, are, what are your most popular 
um, downloads and publications that you've noticed so far? What are the trends? I thought I saw uh, Mary Lou was saying something. I could see that visually, but I couldn't hear. Sorry, I'll try again. I'm not sure if you can still hear me. Uh, I was asking what the trends have been in your downloads. What have been the most popular downloads? What are the trends that you see with people wanting access? Uh, thank you. We can now hear. Um, on our repository, uh, the most uh, sought after title is uh, World Development Report uh, 2013, which we launched in October. Uh, and uh, the, I, I don't have the figure in front of me, uh, but there have been uh, several thousand downloads of that book uh, since it was released uh, in October. Uh, and the, there's something that's, that's very interesting. And that is that uh, if, if you do go to our Open Knowledge Repository, what we call the OKR, which is at openknowledge.worldbank.org, uh, there's something called, uh, well, we basically show the statistics for downloads and abstract views there. Um, but when you look at that particular book, the largest number of downloads are, uh, the first is the US, but the second, third, and fourth to me were really surprising in that they are uh, India, Ethiopia, and Pakistan. Uh, and then the fifth no highest number of downloads come from the UK. Now I should say something. We will approach a million document downloads from the OKR uh, at around the time of the anniversary. But last year we had 6.2 million book reads uh, and uh, downloads uh, across all of the channels in which our content is available for free. Uh, and uh, the OKR had only been launched in April. So if, if the number of book reads and downloads in the current fiscal year which ends in June 30th, uh, we expect it to grow. Uh, but the OKR will you know, perhaps be 20% or more of, of the total downloads or reads, but it's still not the majority. So uh, we get more access currently from Google Books, from Scribd, uh, and so forth, although the trajectory of growth of the OKRs is, is quite, quite high. Uh, there's a question on screen which says, what have you done to promote the OKR? How people finding out about the available information? Uh, well, at, at the time of launch, we, we had a series of events, including uh, 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 we we had uh, Mike Carroll, uh, Heather Joseph from Spark, uh, and uh, Mike Carroll is a, a founder of Creative Commons, uh, and Peter Suber, who's some consider the father of open access, at an event at the World Bank. Uh, we launched Open Access Week with Spark here at the World Bank uh, this past September. Uh, and I've spoken at a number of, of uh, events, including the Open Knowledge Festival in Helsinki in September, and the Berlin 10 conference uh, in uh, November. And just this week on Monday, I spoke to the Association of uh, Medical Students Associations. So it's basically an association of associations. And there were representatives from about 120 countries in that audience. Now, most of the, uh, you know, so that's how we've gotten the word out. But in fact, um, most of the people who come to download a document from, from the repository have never heard me speak, don't know who I am, uh, don't care who I am, uh, and, and, uh, and did not hear about the OKR from anyone. Um, they might have been doing a search on Google Scholar, or they might have been doing a search on their repository uh, where we may have made our repository interoperable with theirs. And so they did a search and downloaded one of our documents because it came up through the results. And I think that that's the beauty um, of open access. Uh, we, we are now interoperable with Google Scholar, uh, with REPEC, which is a repository of economic papers, uh, and some others.
You're welcome. Okay, so it seems that there are no more questions. Um, so I think that it would be appropriate to thank you, Carlos, uh, for your contribution and for making yourself available during the Open Education Week and for informing us about the Open Knowledge Repository. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it and uh, hope to talk to you soon.